Good morning, Soundside Church. Pastor Aaron coming to you this morning with the next installment of our series, Loving God, Loving Each Other. And if you've been with us for the last two Sundays, you know that we are doing a dive into the Ten Commandments to examine how God wants us to live and think about this world in which we live. And so for the last two Sundays, we've been looking at that first commandment, have no other gods before me. And we've spent the first message asking, why? What, what's about this? And then the second message we asked, how? How are some ways that we can make sure that we fulfill this commandment of God? And all along, we are making sure to stress the truth that we do not earn our way towards God. Rather, we receive his grace. And uh, that comes, of course, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Law keeping is no way uh, to make yourself right with God. But it does reveal God's truth 
about how to best live in the world around us. So today we're going to dive into this second commandment, uh, and it's going to show us once again some of the whys, and the next Sunday we're going to look at some of the hows. So what I'd like to do right now is just kind of revisit the scene. So if you can do this for a second, just put yourself in the position of one of those ancient Israelites. You've just been delivered from a lifetime of slavery in Egypt. God, through Moses, has brought you across, or rather through the Red Sea, to a mountain in the middle of the wilderness. And now God descends in this brilliant display of fire and smoke on top of the mountain and announces his presence. And Moses, your leader, goes up that mountain to receive what will come to be called the Ten Commandments. And this is God saying, I've brought you to myself by my grace and my great love. Here is the life I want you to live. And that first commandment we read in Exodus chapter 20 was, you shall have no other gods before me. Here's the second commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." Here's the second commandment. You do not make any carved image of anything in creation and you don't bow down to it. In the older versions, we used to say, thou shalt not make any graven image. Now, the first commandment was don't have any other gods before the one true God. The second commandment is don't make any carved images and bow down to them. And so as we approach the second commandment, our question initially is why? What is the reason behind this commandment? What does this commandment teach us about God and the world around us? And God actually answers the question, why? He says, don't make a carved image or bow down yourself to it. Why, God? Because I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Because God is jealous. He is the only true God, and he claims exclusive worship. Now, at this point, we could maybe say something. We could say, okay, God, you're a jealous God. You're the only one. You claim exclusive worship. So why couldn't I make a statue of you and worship that? Wouldn't that work? I don't have any other gods before you. I've just made a statue or a painting or some representation of you, and I'm worshiping you as I'm worshiping through this. And as a matter of fact, that is something that the Israelites would end up doing at various times in their history. But here's the reason why that doesn't work. Because any attempt to create an image of God automatically misrepresents him. Any attempt to create an image of God automatically misrepresents him. That means it automatically says something false about him. Later on, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, here's what God explained about that day when he delivered the Ten Commandments. He said to them, Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on that day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware you lest, uh, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure. So what God is saying, he says that one of the reasons why you can't make an image of me is remember when I appeared to you, you never actually saw me. You saw the effects of my presence, but you never actually saw me. You heard the voice, you got the commandments, but you didn't see me. All right, and so don't corrupt yourselves by making an image of me because any image of me is going to misrepresent me. It's going to say something false about me. Now, Jesus would say this a little bit more simply. During his ministry, there was an argument about where's the best place to worship God and what's the best form to use. And in John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said this He said, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So our worship must correspond to what God is. God is spirit, and we have to worship him in spirit and in truth. So 
the second commandment is all about all the ways that God is unlike anything in heaven or on earth. Which leads us to this question, what is God like? This second commandment that tells us not to make any carved images of God is based upon the fact that God is unlike anything in heaven or on earth. And so we ask the question, all right, what is God like? For if we must worship him in spirit and in truth, we must know the truth about who he is. And since he is unlike anything else, we have to rely upon his word to tell us what he's like. So that's what we're going to do today. For the rest of this message, we are going to look at what the Bible says God is like. But before we do that, I need to issue a warning. I need to give a note, and then I want to describe a picture. So a warning, a note, and a picture. Okay, so here's what we got. Here's the warning. The warning. As we go through this discussion of what God is like, this one that we worship so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth, as we do this, we are going to talk about why what God is like is important to us, why it makes a difference in our lives. But we shouldn't have to do that. You see, here's the thing. If we love God, and that's really what this is all about, if we love God, our attitude towards theology, that is, studying what God is like, if we love God, our attitude towards theology should be, tell me more, not why should I care? And unfortunately, that's sometimes the, 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 the impression that I get from Christians when we try to talk about theology, you talk, try to talk about what God is like, the attitude sometimes I, I, I feel from people it isn't, oh, this is the God I love, tell me more. The attitude I get is, why should I care? Sometimes the fault is the fault of the preacher or the scholar or the professor who can make ice cream sound boring, okay? But Sometimes the fault is our own hearts. Our hearts are hard, and learning about God, especially in ways that are unlike anything we've experienced, can sometimes take us, make us feel uncomfortable. So I know you're not sitting there saying, Aaron, why should I care what God is like? I hope your attitude is, Aaron, I love this God. Tell me more. Tell me more. So that's the warning. Now, here's a note. You might be listening to this, and you might be a skeptic. Okay? You might be a skeptic. You might be saying, Aaron, uh, if God is unlike everything in heaven and on earth, how could we ever observe it? Why am I trusting the Bible? I mean, uh, I, I can't test this. I can't observe it. I can't hypothesize. I can't experiment. It doesn't correspond to anything in the universe as I know it, so it can't be true. Well, last Sunday, we talked a little bit about that, that approach to life called scientism, that uh, the hard sciences like chemistry and biology and physics, are they, they give us the only genuine knowledge of reality. And, and unfortunately, scientism, uh, let me say it to you like this, science is good, but scientism confuses the goldfish bowl for the ocean. You see, you can't put God under a microscope, but you can immerse yourself in his truth. That's what we're going to do. As we look at what God is like, it's going to be a little bit like visiting an art museum. Now, I know I'm talking to some people right now that love art museums. You love art, and you are the type of person that could sit on that really weird bench in the middle of the gallery and stare at that painting for hours, letting it just impact you, have its effect on you, looking at it in different lights, different perspectives, different angles. You love that sort of thing. And given enough time, I think there are probably some instances where I would love that sort of thing too. But you might be somebody say, Aaron, not a big fan of art galleries, don't know what you're talking about. And so what I want you to think of this morning is I want you to think of me as your guide. We're going to walk through the art museum, we're going to walk through the art gallery, and we're going to pause at each piece. And I'm going to point a few things out and tell you what that's like, and then we're going to move on to the next. We're not going to spend hours staring straight at that piece of art, because in truth, even the best piece of art, you could stare at it for a long time, and you could eventually see everything there is to be seen. So instead of me being your guide through an art gallery, I'd like you to think of this instead. Picture a house. A house on top of a mountain with a view 360 degrees. And I want you to imagine walking into that house, and I'm your host. 
and I'm gonna give you a tour of the house. And as we walk through the house, I'm not gonna pause in front of a painting on the wall. I'm gonna pause in front of each window. And I'm gonna invite you to look out that window. And I'm gonna invite you to see all that you can see out that window. And then we're gonna move on to the next window and the next window. And every time we move to a window, you're gonna get a different view. You're gonna see something completely different, but you're also gonna be aware of the fact that if you stood there for a lifetime, you would still never see all there is to see. That's what looking at God is like. We're gonna gain some different perspectives on what he's like, but you could stop at any one of these and you could read a chapter, you could read a book, you could read a library on each of these attributes of what God is like. So, with that in mind, let's take our tour, let's look through some windows and recognize that the view goes as far as our eye can see, but our eyes aren't the limit of how far God goes. So let's begin. What is God like? Well, Jesus said it, didn't he? God is spirit. So here's how I would say that for us this morning. This is the first attribute of what God is like for us. God is not physical. God is spirit. We human beings, we are made of dust. We say it often, right? Uh, from dust to dust. We're made of dust, and in the words of A.W. Tozer, we've never quite been able to shake all the dust off of ourselves. The fact that God is spirit is tough for dust people to comprehend because it's completely outside of our experience. But here's what I want you to understand. Matter, what we're made of, is one way of existing. Spirit, that's another way of existing. Spirit is a completely different mode of existence. You know, I, I googled what is the universe, and one definition of the universe is the universe is all matter and energy and time and space. That's a fine definition of the universe. All matter, energy, time, and space. The problem with that is spirit doesn't correspond to any of those. Spirit isn't matter. Maybe there's some energy connected to it, but it's not testable. It's not matter. It's not energy. It's not time or space as we're going to describe it. And so if we're used to understanding the universe as matter, energy, time, and space, we're going to have a very difficult time grappling with the idea of spirit. And yet that is who God is. He is spirit. So that gives us some implications, right? That tells us how we should live and think about God. One implication of the fact that God is spirit is this. We should never imagine God in any sort of physical form. Now, I, I had a pastor friend one time who used to say, you know, I invite people to tell me, tell me, what do you think God looks like? And he says, without a doubt, I, I know what you think God looks like. He looks like Charlton Heston. You say, who? Not the Planet of Apes, Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, you know, Moses, right? When people say, what does God look like? A lot of people instantly imagine this Moses-like character in their head, an old man with long flowing white hair and a long white beard. And maybe Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel is responsible for that. But if God is spirit, then we should not try to imagine him in any sort of physical form. But that brings up something else, and that is many times in the Bible we read things about God's hands or God's feet or God's eyes, and I'm just here to tell you that that's one of those things that your English teacher tried to tell you back in ninth grade when you were studying poetry, and your English teacher used that big long word, anthropomorphism, and all that means is this is a poetic device that helps us imagine something by likening it to a human body part. God doesn't have human body parts. He's spirit. Nevertheless, God may describe himself in terms that are familiar to us because we are humans with body parts. So when we read these things in the Bible, it's not like a contradiction like, oh, I thought you said God was spirit and here he has a hand. No, God is accommodating you so that you can understand what he is like. But I'll tell you something. There's a great application of this. If God is spirit, not physical at all, that really shows us how important it was for God himself, who is pure spirit, to take on a physical form when he was born a baby boy. I'm talking about Jesus, the incarnation, the enfleshment of God Almighty. The Bible tells us why Jesus did that, why Jesus changed his mode of existence 
and he did it for us. Listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. The Bible says this, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted." I would invite you to look at those verses later and maybe ponder a little bit more about what it means for God who is spirit to humble himself and become human for us. God is spirit. God is spirit. All right, the second attribute that we're going to look at about God today is what we call God's omnipotence. Big word, and all it means is this. God can do anything he wants. God can do anything he wants, omnipotent. The Bible says in Jeremiah 32, verse 17, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And that sentiment is expressed various other places in the Bible. With men, with human beings, things can be impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. In fact, many places in the Bible kind of implicitly tell us this with God's name. One of the names for God is God Almighty. And a lot of times you'll hear people talk about the Almighty, right? Maybe not so much anymore, but Almighty. What does Almighty mean? It means, very literally, all-powerful. Anytime the Bible calls God, the Lord God Almighty, it is implicitly referring to the fact that he can do anything he wants. Now, I'm very specific about the fact that God can do anything he wants because some people like to be cute. Some people like to be clever and they try to figure out things that maybe God can't do or try to figure out things that are kind of contradictions with this God who can do anything he wants. So I want to be careful that we understand God can do whatever he wants to do Or rather, God can do whatever he wants to do that is consistent with his nature. Uh, You can't want to do something that's not consistent with your nature. Okay, which, but this means that God can't sin. God can't sin, all right? He is holy, he is sinless, so he can't sin. In fact, the Bible says God cannot lie, all right? There's something God can't do. Um, But some people like to take it a little bit farther. Some people like to say, well, God can't do anything. Can, can God make a rock so big he can't move it? All right, so there's two things God can't do. God can't sin, and God can't validate stupidity. <laughs> All right? And what I mean by God can't validate stupidity is, is that thing right there, right? Can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? That's not a measure of strength. That's a measure of philosophy and logic, and it's a logical contradiction. Such you know, Some people say, well, can God make a square circle? Um, no, because that's stupid. All right. So that's, that's what we're talking about. God can do anything he wants to do that's consistent with his nature. Um, but things that people think up that are just dumb, uh, he doesn't validate stupidity. Okay. Now, uh, right here, and, and, and I do want to address one possible objection. Um, this is kind of a famous objection that atheists like to pose towards believers in God. And I could address this in a number of different ways, but I'm going to throw it out there. And, and that is, you know, atheists will come up with this and they, they think they're being clever. And, and I don't mean disrespect to atheists, all right? But they do think they're being clever with this um, when they say, well, oh my goodness, I mean, there's so much evil in the world. So either God is all powerful and not good uh, because there's so much evil out there, or, or maybe he's good and he's just not all powerful. Uh, the assumption is that God, if he was all powerful and all good, would remove all evil from the universe. And as a matter of fact, that is exactly what God fully intends to do, and he's working out his plan to do that, as the scriptures tell us. 
But there are other factors in mind. In fact, the world that the atheist in view, uh, the world that the atheist envisions with this God that they're complaining about is itself a logical contradiction because we have to think about the nature of evil and the nature of choice and the freedom of creatures to make their own decisions and affect their own lives. And that objection runs into its own logical contradictions uh, that have no bearing on whether or not God is good or all-powerful or all-knowing. So we do have a God that is all-powerful. He can do anything he wants to do. So when the Bible says in Ephesians 3.20 that our God is able to do more than anything we can ask him to do, and God is able to do more than anything we can even imagine, then I would say there's an implication for us as Christians to pray big prayers. Pray big prayers if God is all-powerful. I mean, come on, think about it like this. Let me ask you this question. If all your prayers, if all the prayers you prayed today come true tomorrow, would anybody's lives be changed? Would the world be a different place if all of your prayer requests were answered? Now, I know Jesus said in John 15, he said, if you pray according to my will, I'll hear you and you'll have your prayers answered. And people have said, well, I've prayed things and they didn't get answered. Well, okay, so there's a few things. The problem isn't necessarily that God can't do it. In fact, that isn't the problem at all. Maybe sometimes the problem is us. We're not praying according to his will. We're just praying what we want rather than trying to seek what God wants because <laughs> God's able to do anything he wants to do. So the question isn't, what do I want? The question is, God, what do you want? And bring my prayers into line with that. One other application, if we've got a God that can do anything, and that is this, when it comes to our faith, we can stand firm in our faith, knowing that God can do anything. There's a great example from the book of Daniel, where there were three Israelite men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or uh, their Hebrew names, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and um, Azariah doesn't really matter. But uh, they were told, you have to bow down before this idol, or I will, th or they will get thrown into this fiery furnace. And they said, well, we're not going to bow down to the idol. And the king said, well, then I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace unless you bow down to the idol. And do you know what those three Israelite men said? They basically looked at that king and they said, they said, we don't know what God will do, but we do know that God can rescue us from your hand. We don't know that he will, but we know that he can. And they refused to bow. They got chucked into that fiery furnace. And if you know the rest of the story, you know that God did, in fact, deliver them. So as Christians, we can stand firm. We don't necessarily know what God will do, but we do know what he can do. And that should give us courage to stand firm. Well, God is a spirit. We know that. God is all-powerful. But there's something else we should look at here as we're looking at what God is like. God knows everything. What do we call that? That is God's omniscience. Another fancy word, God's omniscience. He knows everything. The psalmist said this. David said this in Psalm 139, verse 4. He said, Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. What? What? Before I speak a word, God, you know what I'm going to say? Yeah, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other scriptures that talk about the things that God knows. Now, let me just draw this out for you. When we're talking about what God knows, God not only knows things that are actual, he also knows things that are possible. God knows both what did happen and what didn't happen. He knows what would happen, what could happen, and what should happen, as well as what did happen, what will happen, and what is happening. God knows all these things. Secondly, God knows differently than we do. Let me explain this. Our minds, us, our minds are like empty flash drives that get data stored in them. All right. Our knowledge is basically the record of life as we've lived it. Our, our knowledge is, is the record of life that we've experienced. On the other hand, though, life is actually a record of God's knowledge. Our knowledge is a record of life. Life is a record of God's knowledge. You see, God doesn't learn. 
God doesn't discover. God is not surprised. God cannot be taught. God cannot be informed. God does not deduce. God does not conclude. God knows both what is and what isn't, and he knows them with absolute perfection and accuracy, which means he can never be wrong. Now, this has some implications for us because on the surface, it just means that God knows us better than we know ourselves. Very famous passage, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? (laughs) You know what the next verse says? I, the Lord, search the hearts and test the minds. See, our hearts are so deep, we can't know ourselves to the very depths of our own being, but God does. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And I would just apply this to every Christian. I would just say, look, Christian, don't assume you know everything. A lot of times we make our decisions based upon what we assume we know will happen. A very famous missionary, John Payton, a Scottish missionary to the New Hebrides, uh, today known as Vanuatu, um, he was going to these, these South Seas Islands, these South Pacific Islands, to carry the gospel of Christ, and he had people telling him not to go. In fact, one old man uh, in, a, in a church stood up and he said, you can't go, you'll be eaten by cannibals, which some missionaries had been eaten by cannibals at that point. He said, John, you can't go, you will be eaten by cannibals. And this great missionary looked at that old man and he said, Mr. Dixon, You are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I am eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. Uh, There's a lot to be learned from the example of that missionary, but the fact of the matter was he wasn't going to let what somebody thought they knew about the future stop him from serving God. And the point that I would make for us is that we cannot know the future, but we can trust an uncertain future to a certain God. He already knows what's going to happen, which means the safest place you can ever be is exactly where God wants you to be. All right, well, we've looked at three of these attributes of God. We've looked at the fact that he's spirit, that he's all-powerful, that he's all-knowing. We need to continue. God is omnipresent. That means God is everywhere. God is everywhere. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. King Solomon is dedicating the building of the temple to God, and he says this, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Now, I I think this verse is very intriguing for a great reason, and that is Solomon confessed the heavens can't contain God, and yet he's going to come dwell in this building? And that helps us understand something. There are many scriptures that describe the fact that God is everywhere, places we wouldn't even imagine, but God isn't everywhere at all times in the same way. The most obvious example uh, being Jesus. Uh, Jesus is God, and where Jesus was, God was. But God being present everywhere, he was more obviously present wherever Jesus was. Likewise, that temple Solomon built, God's glory came down and filled that building. Did that mean that God wasn't in heaven anymore? Well, no, God was still in heaven. Does that mean that God wasn't out on the ocean somewhere at the same time? Of course he was. He was just more obviously present in the temple. Now, understanding this helps us recognize that God is, in fact, everywhere. But if God can be more obviously present in certain ways and in certain times and places, then that gives a little bit of urgency to the command we find in Scripture to be filled with God's Spirit. Christians can be filled with God's Spirit. It does no good to say, well, God's everywhere. He must be in me. And in a way, that's true. But God says, I want to be in you in a very special, obvious, and powerful way. And that's open to Christians to be filled with God's Spirit in a way that He is present, not like where He's present everywhere else. There's another beautiful comfort from that. If God is everywhere, then it helps us understand what Jesus said. Right before He left to go back to heaven, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, Jesus said, And behold, I am with you even till the end of the age. Christian, you are never anywhere that God is not with you. He's with you always because He's everywhere. 
Well, what do we know about God? He's spirit. We got the omnis, omnipotent, omniscience, omnipresent. But God is also eternal. God is eternal. That is, he created time. He created time. Revelation 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, taken together with God's omnipresence, God's eternity is part of a larger concept that we call God's infinity. God is not limited by space, but he's also not limited by time. God exists before and after and completely outside of time. Yet he sees time and he acts within time. And that's why terms like predestination and foreknowledge are so very important. You you can't just dismiss predestination and foreknowledge by saying, well, don't you know, time doesn't apply to God. (laughs) When God says that he has predestined or foreknown something, God applies himself to time, though he himself can never be limited by time. That may seem confusing, and that's a subject for another time. No pun intended. But one application for us is this. If God exists outside of time, although he sees time and he acts within time, we can know that God is never in a hurry, and we can know that God is never late, although we ourselves often wonder what's taking him so long. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 says, Beloved, don't forget this, that one day with God is like a thousand years, But a thousand years with God is like one day. That's not a formula, by the way. That's just helping us understand that God sees time and interacts with time very differently than we do. In John chapter 11, we learn that Jesus found out his friend Lazarus had died. And he waited several days and he got there four days later. And... The man's, you know, Lazarus' sisters complained. They said, Lord, if you'd just gotten here a little earlier, you know, our brother wouldn't have died. But Jesus got there right on time because he walked over to that grave. They pulled the, the rock back. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus rose from the dead at the power of Jesus. Oh, he might have gotten there later than the sisters wanted, but he got there right on time to perform one of his greatest miracles in raising Lazarus from the dead and bringing great joy to that family and glory to God. The implication for us Christians is this. If God is eternal, then Christians should be people of great patience and great endurance. And we should always be ready for his return, lest he come at a time when we are not prepared. Well, that's a great beginning look at what God is like. We've looked at a couple others in previous weeks. Two weeks ago, we looked at what we called God's independence, his self existence. Uh, Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. God exists independent of anything else. He exists by virtue of himself. We also looked back in January at something we call God's immutability, the fact that he can't change. He does not change. Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord. I do not change. But we would be confused, confusing ourselves if we were to take all these things we've said about God today and say, well, these sound like parts of God. And that's another attribute of him. He's simple. He's simple in the sense that he's not made up of parts. He is completely whole. Um, these attributes we've been talking about, God, these aren't, these aren't parts of God, like, like a door or a window or a roof of a house. No, everything we've said about God is true about God completely, and nothing we say about God conflicts with anything else we say about God. So, for instance, God is all-powerful and all-knowing, and these are not in conflict with one another. Which brings us to our final attribute of God, and that is God is sovereign. God rules over all. Listen, listen to these, listen to these verses, because right now, I know if if you're still paying attention, if you followed along, you'd say, Aaron, I do struggle to think of God in these ways because everything you've said is so unlike anything that I'm familiar with. And that's kind of the point. He is God and there is none like him. That does make it a little tough to understand. It does mean we have to receive by faith what his word has said about him. But listen to this, Isaiah 46 verses 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. Listen, I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. 
and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose. God rules over all, and he is unlike anything you've ever experienced. God is unlike anything in our experience. And what's more, he is in control of our experience. But our experience, that is, our lives, are all part of a master plan that includes all time and all space. And things that we cannot possibly imagine are good are still part of the whole. And the whole will result in glory to God and the eternal joy of God's people. That's why Christians cling to Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. So my question to you here at the end of this message is this. Do you love this God? Do you love this God? Because without a doubt, he loves you. And that is a magnificent treasure that this God we've just described, in terms completely foreign to any human experience, he knows you and he loves you. And he proved it by humbling himself and becoming one of us to die in our place, to remove our sins and bring us to himself. So I would invite you to do this. In the few moments following this message, I would invite you to declare your love for God. Do that. If you don't know, if you can say that honestly, man, we would love to talk to you. We would love to invite you to know him and love him by receiving his free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. But if you have done that, you say, Aaron, this is the God I believe in. I would invite you to declare your love for him. Thank him for his attributes. Maybe ask him to reveal himself more fully to you so that you can know him better. But declare your love for him and confess your faith in his love for you. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for your word and I thank you so much for your great grace to reveal these glorious truths about yourself. And Lord, we do love you. We do love you. Let our love be seen in the way that we keep your commandments. But Lord, we love you because you first loved us and gave your son Jesus in our place. Lord, we honor you. We worship you. We seek your glory and we will rejoice as we give honor to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Who you are. That is who. You are.